I wanted to introduce some color to your process, and it's exciting because the color we're talking about today can be used in many different stages, even when you're still making changes to the form. So it's a kind of a more structural way in a, in a very uh, formal sense to get color going in ceramics. Um, we will be adding to this vocabulary when we talk about glaze, which is a, uh, probably on Thursday, or maybe the first of next week. Um, so essentially what I'd like for you to do is think about all the color today as being made up of clay. It's like a colored clay that you're using. And so you probably know that when clay is fired, there's shrinkage, but there's no deflection. There's no real melting. The clay stays solid. This color is the same way. It's more like paint you're used to because the unfired material, while it does move a little bit, it stays stable. So your line will stay in the line. So you're going to like that quality of it. There are changes in color because it is chemistry. Okay. Um, and all, all color that's fired in ceramics is made up of metal. That's the power of color. And so that's why there's some surprises when the, um, you see the transformation, the chemical transformation of color in the kiln because um, chemistry, um, you know, red and blue don't make purple necessarily in ceramics. You know, it's not the same kind of color wheel um, in the body. So I just want to, since we're starting with color, I think when you get color involved, particularly, it's really important to, to start to make notes about um, that'll have will allow you to decode your fired results exactly. Um, and what I mean by that is keep a kind of glaze journal that takes note of exactly what materials you're using in the layering so that when some surprises happen, you have a way of remembering and knowing exactly what happened. Okay, it's really important. Of course our phones uh, taking the pictures before the kiln and then comparing them to after is also a very um, useful way to do that. So two materials, they both look here. Um, they're both essentially colored clay, but there's some um, different qualities uh, that I want you to be aware of. The first one are these tops here. And they're um, our colored slips. And as you know from our last talk about joining clay, um, it, it, you know, when you have two different pieces of drier clay and you want to join them, you add a kind of liquid form of your clay body, which is slip. This is not the clay body. This is not our liquid clay body. This is a neutral slip that these metals were added to for color. And um, we have two different versions of the colors we are offering. One is brushable, which means it's thinner. And one is impasto, which means it's more of a thick consistency. And there are different reasons why you might choose one over the other, and we'll go over that in a minute. The other material we're going to be talking about are these jars. These are commercial underglaze. And it's essentially the same metals, except in a, not in a clay body, but in water. So the main difference in the slip and the underglaze is opacity. The slips tend toward opacity. They'll really cover everything that they go on top of. These, especially underneath glaze, will reveal translucency. You'll see things coming through them. You can use them together as a palette. Just remember, if slip goes on top of underglaze, this is going to go away. But if this goes on top of slip, you're going to get the complexity of something, a color coming through a color. So we'll go over some of that as we go to. So, I wanted to have our talk be centered around when you, in, when you work with color, from wet clay, leather hard clay, and then bone dry clay. Working before the first firing with these colors gives you the opportunity to fire on something so that when we get to glazing, the water and the glaze won't move this underpaint. It'll be fired on, like it'll be transformed like clay, fired clay is. So I rolled out a wet slab, and uh, I wanted to 
kind of use it to talk about the advantages of working on wet clay. Another thing I should mention is when you're using the slip, think of it as shrinking just like the wet clay is shrinking when it's dry. So you only really want to use these heavier coatings of colored slip on a form that has moisture in it. So they have a chance to shrink together. If you do something really thick on a bone dry piece of clay, it will shrink away and want to crack off of the form. Okay? Under glaze can be applied at every stage because it doesn't have that shrinkage. You can even reapply it after the first fire up and keep going with it. Okay, so I'm just going to make what I call mash around on this, you know, pretend like I'm working. I mean, I am working on Look at show and stuff. So I've got a few of these slips. Now, another thing, so would you mind? There's a, a dispenser of gloves, plastic gloves on the wall in the corner. Would you just get some of the whatever's there? Two, two of them? Yeah. So I just have to mention that most of our colors um, are not really toxic per se. Thank you so much. But because, as I said before, they're made up of metal, if you're handling raw pigment, ceramic pigment, you're handling metal. And over time, that metal could enter your bloodstream through your cuticles. So I would say, although you're not likely to get that kind of metal poisoning in a 15-week or six-week summer ceramics class, people like me that have been handling them for 30 years really need to be careful, right? So we have usually gloves in every size there for you to use if you want to kind of protect your hands. I'm about to get kind of finger painty, so I know I'm going to be handling Okay. So all ceramic, almost all ceramic color is suspended in water. So the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure you stir the main containers before using them. The good stuff settles, leaving the water on the top. So you want to make sure everything's in suspension. Of course, I didn't really bring anything to do that. But So I should show you some finished tiles too. I think I put uh, here. We're going to use the colored slip first. You will notice when we get to um, the glazing, we have these test um, tiles for you to begin research with glaze. And they're labeled which of our shock glazes are on top. On the bottom of each, this is our clay body that you're building with fire to the higher temperature. That's what it looks like. These are the slips, the different colors, fired on in the first fire. These are the, this is the same translucent glaze over the background of the colored slip. So you can see that even if you're not doing a traditional painted image that needs to be preserved, that it can be a subtle way to change the glaze by underpainting a color underneath. All right, so these you can really study, but all of them have the base colors of the fired slip there. The only one we don't have, I believe, is the pink slip, which is not really, doesn't have a fired tile, but all the other colors are. You will see the color of your material will not be the color it's fired, usually. What makes this um, brown slip brown is iron. That's the metal. And so you can see iron in this form, and iron when it's fired higher is more to brown. Okay, so you just have to kind of, that's why firing is important for surface building, because you have to fire your paint box to understand it. Okay. This is a low fire tile. These are all the slip colors, including the paint. And this has been put through a second fire, not at our high temperature, but at a low temperature with a clear. And this is a low fire white on top of the slip. So you can see, the, even just with a clear glaze, the depth of color is going to be very different for these slips. Right. 
Okay. So you will want to have some soft brushes. Um, and you know, it's really vital when you're dealing with ceramic color that you not contaminate with a dirty brush the main container. Um, so just have some big, uh, some things of water. So if you only have one brush, just make sure the brush is clean before you put it in another container, right? Pretty straight there. So you will notice um, because I'm working on a wet form, this color is going to stay wet a very long time. There's no place for the water and the color to absorb into. And this leads me to the not really a main reason why you would want to work on wet clay. It allows for this color to stay suspended so I can keep moving it without it absorbing it and becoming a mud, like a dry graphic mud. This is the challenge of painting in most ceramic processes, is what you're painting is porous, and your water-based material, your brush hits, and almost before you finish that one stroke, it's absorbed. And it's now the second coat is gonna make a streakiness of overlay of wetter, the next coat on top of the graphic um, edges of the first coat. So I can just, the good news about slip and underbuds is you can do a little mixing when they're wet so that they make a new color. But it's because they're metals, if you do like three different colors together, likely it could is in the kiln fire, it'll be a muddiness to it. It'll be like a gray, grayish color. So you don't have a lot. So I'm going to take, this is like yellow clay that you could almost build with, right? This is pasta. Okay. I love it. So. so if I were to dry this and fire it right now, you would see that wet, marbly striation fired on like something to work with later. painting the really thick form like this. Again, when this is fired, this is after the first firing, similar kind of thing. You can see the raised color. Now it's a hard clay form to work with. All of that was that really wet stage. So now I'm going to just pour out a little underglaze. Remember these, this speed, there are many different commercial companies that make these underglazes. Speedball, you may know from the printing materials for screen printing and everything. They make ceramic pigments that have the body, the thickness that they can go through a screen so you can screen underglaze on the clay. So these have a heavier body, but they are not as heavy as the slits. Um, for COVID, we had to eliminate a little plastic. Um, maybe I can just do this. We have pallets usually in the studio. It is so much fun to paint on white clay when you have it in It's like the surface is so alive. So I'm, do, I'm doing the world's dumbest painting right now, in my opinion. Okay. So another reason why wet clay is because it's wet, I still have the potential to make a hollow form and make my choices by stretching against this painting instead of decorating a rigid object, sort of like the form exists and can't really change very much, but I'm kind of decorating it. 
So what that might look like is, I'm going to take my knife, which of course I've been lost. Do you see it anywhere? Ah, oh. Hold up, I know it's here somewhere. I'll just... Uh, this is the worst uh, table for a demo, really. I'll just use this thing. I said, oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. I so I've made a little flat form that could be the floor of a hollow shape I'm making. But I think of it more as a temporary surf work surface because I'm going to be trying to lift this flat form and arch it without overtouching the painting and, get, and then bring it back to make a cylinder. I want this wet edge to grab onto the clay and become stable. You know, it will help create more of a structure. Even if I remove this later um, and do something else, it's at least a temporary. I just made a cup. I'm going to save this. I might use it another way. establish that arch because that's the structure is the outward arching form so I don't want it to go flat I'll lose the structure okay so this is what um, this is kind of the cool exciting part now that I have this really still wet form I can both push into the hollowness and stretch out against the painting start to have the form respond from the cues of my done painting, right? Oh wow, I'm going to really push a domed form out behind this. starts to be activated somehow. And there's that kind of really nice, the stretch marks behind the moments of the painting. Okay. So, this, this may, this kind of wet shape may have slid if I were when I raised it. And there would be a like a trail, like a snail trail. So you have to be prepared for gravity to start to work. And when something is really, really wet and being held, and then it's going to the potential to slide. So just like everything in ceramics is about waiting until there's stable stability for the next thing you want to do. I personally love the moments of those actions of movement. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I want the movement, so I would pick it up. Okay, another way to think of wet clay being integrated is an opportunity to talk about a historic, traditional way of working with colored clay, where you put the pigment in the clay body and you're building with clay that's got color in it all the way through. So, that's known as Neriage, N-E-R-I-A-G-E. And Neriage, the best way to describe Neriage is to think of your sushi chef. I'm going to just do this. Your sushi chef, when you're sitting there watching the chef construct your rolls, 
you know, one of the amazing things about it, they're served as sections, and there's patterns in the section. So if you could think, you know, of course we know that that pink dot in the section of roll is actually a rod, a round rod of tuna when it's constructed in the sort of a loaf. So think of building with different colored clays to build these kind of loaves so that when you cut them, there's a pattern section. And then you build hollow forms with pattern sections so the pattern and color go all the way through. It's not a surface painting, it's pattern that goes on. That's Ariadne. We're not doing that. But you can use some of this color while you're building to have this loose color built into the form. So I'm making a coil, as you can see. And I'm just going to roll it. not only with my fingertips and the pressure, the color gets displaced and gets registered with color. This is very loose. But what if the next coil was a different color? And then the yellow gets brought up in the handling to make the new color. So you can build in kind of an ombre, coil by coil. Now this can all be edited when this stiffens. I can scrape it, leave in residue. I can add more. I can fill it in. You know, there's ways to to fine tune it after past these really wet stages. I think I'll just do one more and we'll move on. By the way, perhaps the most staining pigment in ceramics is iron. So most things wash out of your clothing. Anything this red iron like this will not. So be super careful about what you wear if you're going to use this brown slip. So I can also very quick. So dip it down. The wetter the clay, the more loose it's going to be. As this stiffens toward lever hard, I can scrape, I can carve through, I can add tightness, I can come with more color on top of the dry color. So these are built over stages, just like when you're building a more complicated form with coils or another hand building process. Okay, so let's put this on the side. I just want to show you two hi-fi examples of this type. This are the same, it's almost the same demo, except it's got a very thick clear over it. So all the things that seemed really opaque become translucent because of the chemistry of the clear eating into the color below. A thinner clear would have gotten less of that chemistry probably. Clear is passive visually, but it's very aggressive chemically, so you have to be careful with it thinking the clear is going to just allow. But you can see the colors, how they transform underneath the glaze. There's the pink slip. This is a piece that has sprayed white glaze, which is an opacifying, kind of softening 
I trailed through like a baby syringe of um, white glaze to make more of a glaze pattern on top. And then you can sort of see the softer palette. There's a, that was solid pink slip that was kind of attached. place where many people working in clay would start to bring color, these colors too. Because the forms have been decided upon. You've added the foot, you've carved it, you've added the handle, you put the complicated form together from parts, whatever. So this is more traditional. What's great about this medium dryness for this color is you still can put some pretty heavy, heavy impasto slip surfaces, but there's also some room in the wall to absorb the color more quickly so it will stabilize faster. So you can work with another color on top of a dry bottom layer instead of wet mixing it together, which is not the greatest thing for the chemistry. So two things. Um, one thing I want to talk about that's good for this stage is there's sometimes you don't want in ceramics, some of the most rich ceramic um, objects in my opinion are ones where you can see all the way from the last stages of glazing to the wet clay itself. So I can see the touching, like a history of your touch. So inside of that, you may want to protect an area of this surface for something that comes later, so that you're not doing it all in colored slip. There's a moment that it would look protected from glazing or some other effect. So that we call a reserve in ceramics. And I just came in and cut out out of newspaper a shape that this represents the part of the surface that I want to protect from my slipper. I like newspaper because it's not, it doesn't break apart in water quickly, but yet it's pretty flexible and it's readily available. I'm just going to make it wet. Now I'm going to laminate it to the area I want to protect. What allows this to be laminated is the moisture in this clay. If this were bone dry, it would be so porous, this would pop off. Okay, so I'm just, I want to make sure the edges are tight. Now, of course, I'm messing up my demo with color. Let me see if I can see. Okay. Now I can do slip work. Build up layers of slip or one color, get a really thick black slip on top of that neutral clay. Then I would want all the water to, to go into the wall, leaving a drier black before I remove that newspaper. In the best spirit of Martha Stewart, I came in and did one earlier, so you wouldn't have to wait for it to dry. I'm so pleased when I do it. Oh my god, I have Okay. So what I want to do is find the edge of the shape. So you can see the sharpness of the paper and the recession. I literally, it reveals the physicality of the black clay. So when I fire this on, that little recessed area would have a very different implication with glaze on top. Uh, so I'm setting up something to be continued in a later stage. Another thing to think about with leather hard 
is something we call sgraffito. It's an Italian term. And sgraffito is a removal through a top coat of color into a contrasting color below. When, if you ever as a child had wax crayons and you did multicolored all over your paper and then a black crayon on top and you scratch through the black to get a multicolored line, that's your feet up. So in this case, I can simply have a drier black slip. The dampness of the form will allow me to do deeper carving. And I have a small, you can see, a trim tool. Okay, this deeper carving, so when I fire this, the black will be fired on, leaving that neutral recessed line. But when we glaze after the first firing, I could actually inlay a colored red glaze, fill that little trough of line with a glassy red line of glaze, leaving a dry black surface. So there's a few ways to to handle it. Or, if you want to think of, I mean, I can show you artists that work this way, but just with the two colors, black and white clay, get to the most elaborate imagery just by carving through, almost like a lino cut. So you might want to set up a drawing this way that you respond to with more layers Oops. as we go through. But leather heart is a really good stage for this. And you can see already that this is stabilized. Like this wet form is going to be wet a long time. This, now I could either carve through, I can put other color on top without it mixing with the black. So it is a really good chance uh, to quickly have all the options as to work with my work. Okay, so another stage to work with these materials is when your clay is bone dry before the first fire. This is a very brittle moment for your piece, right? It's also really susceptible to water breaking it down. So even a thick, wet block of slip the water would rush into this and break down the form. So you want to be very, if you're working with painting in bone dry clay, you want to control how much water, you kind of want to build your image with thinner coats with drying time in between so it's not flooding it. If you will. What I like about working with bone dry clay is even just a regular number two pencil allows me to plan my drawing. So I can do some more plan way to lay down my underglazing slip. And then so you can see almost instantly it absorbed. And now I have a graphic edge. So I can take a damp brush and continue to play with what that edge is of the color, move it around, get more watercolor. So it's, you can get really, really controlled painting. This is where you would write the Gettysburg Address with a small brush, black underglaze, and that would hold, you know, in the fire. Uh, Look at the sgraffito through the dry color into the clay form, this shallow lines in the dry structure of the clay. Okay. So I have a few colors here. I don't really have black on the black out there. So again, bear in mind that when red goes over the blue, especially since the blue is stable and dry, 
there will be translucency through, and that section will appear purple. The blue will come through the red underneath the glaze layer. So you can get to some very controlled, detailed, and resonant kinds of paintings with this layering on, on the dry on a piece of clay. I could have started with really wet stuff and gotten to this level with this, that. I could be treating that piece at a drier stage with this level of subtlety too, right? It's not just one or the other. Um, the last thing I think I want to sort of talk about this stuff is the ability to work with the dry clay as a removal to, to put contrast again to the texture here by staining it. So you, I'll just use the blue. So I'm just going to go, I would apply kind of a swatch of this color. Okay. Once I can see it's absorbed and there's no surface moisture, I will take a sponge, some water, So you can see here, it's sort of like inlaying it into the texture, but the dampness from the sponge is also changing the clay form and softening it. If I wanted this to be exactly as it is, I would disc fire the form and then stain it so that the water couldn't make a change on the form itself. Okay, so you can play around with color a very subtle under that you fire on and then it dictates subtly through a glaze or again more transparent or translucent glazes will allow this to come through like the thin, more finished effect of the zoom. These do not when you fire to the higher glaze temperature, which they all probably will be. These colors don't flow like glaze. They don't have the glassy components. So they're safe if they touch the bottom of the piece where they're sitting on a shelf and won't be used. But we usually ask that you leave some raw clay on the box so we can see what's going on, okay? Just a little bit of dollar for the clay. But you could use a small brush with underglaze to write your name on the bottom. You can, you know, they're, they're pretty, like I said, stable and safe. Um, they don't stick or flow. So um, these materials are here, what I would recommend is since we're almost at midterm, if you can believe it. How could that be? I just don't need, I can't eat it. Um, what, we're, what we need though is for some of your first pieces to maybe have some color experiments on them. Use the hot box to get, get them dry on the shelf for the first fire, for this firing. So that on Tuesday they will have gone through a fire and we can talk about glaze. Don't be so precious. Try thick, thin, different layers. Make them a patchwork quilt of different information that you're gathering about the color. That's a better abuse. There'll be other pieces for your retrospective at Mama, I promise. I promise. I can't wait to celebrate with you. But not these. Um, so if you could do that, Thursday would be the day to have that first fire, but they have to have color and be bone dry. So you just need to kind of the time in that a little bit. Otherwise, this kind of coil belt grouping you're doing, um, what I would like is for also on Thursday that a lot of the wet work feels done and the drier stages are there for you to take away, to add, color, whatever, so that we can talk about slab building on Thursday. And there's, a, there's another kind of um, technical process I want you to have room in your ceramic time for. So just kind of use as best you can, push them further along in a shorter amount of time. Thank you for nodding yes. It really is good to know. It's like, sometimes it's like I'm just talking to... Um, okay, any questions? Alrighty.